Good evening. We are ready for a Bible study. Um, so we are going through the book of John. So whoever has the Bibles, we can open to, to um, the Gospel of John. We're going to start from the first chapter. We're going to do a recap. We got 13 verses. We're going to recap uh, things we have already studied up, talked about, had questions about. Um, I just want to recap it quickly, and then we're going to start from verse 14, and then we're going to go verse by verse. And it's going to be more about interacting, interactive, um, it's kind of Bible study. So I appreciate your questions. It kind of helps me to uh, explain things longer. So I don't, we don't go through the whole chapter in like 10 minutes and then like, okay. All right. We're and done. We're done, yeah. All right. So in the beginning, so it goes to the beginning. Now, when it says in the beginning, it actually means before anything was created. There was a time. When there was nothing created, it was just God. There was no heavens, obviously there was no earth. Not one angel, was, not one spirit was created. It was just God. So when it says in the beginning, that's where it talks about. There was a time when there was nothing yet created. So it says in the beginning was the Word. Now we know that the Word or the Word of God is a name that Jesus has. Because he is the Word of God, that's who he is. And the Bible, in many places, refers to Jesus as the Word. It's the Word of God, as a spoken Word. That's who he is. So, you can read it. That in the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus, or the Word, was with God. And the Word was God. In the very first um, couple sentences, John establishes that Jesus is fully God, uh, which means there was never a time that Jesus did not exist. Never. He was always there. Now, he was a spirit, and the Bible has places where it talks about that there is a spirit of Jesus. That's how he can be with us and in us, because he was a spirit. There was a time when Jesus, as the Word of God, He was a spirit, and He dwelled in God. He was in God, so that means you couldn't see Him. In fact, you can't see God, because He's a spirit. And Jesus, or the Word, or the Spirit, was in God. And it was fully God. That means it was from the same substance, yet distinct personality. He is a different person from the Father. That's a distinction. Even though he's fully united to the Father, he was in the Father, but he is a different person than the Father. All right, verse, verse uh, 2, he was in the beginning with God. So it talks about the fellowship between Jesus and the Father from the eternity, from the very beginning. The dynamic fellowship and love between Father and Jesus, and obviously the Holy Spirit too. All things were made through him. So everything that was created, so as heavens were created, it was created through Jesus. He is the spoken word. Well, what does that mean? That means that God is the head. He is the originator of everything. Everything originates with the Father. Now, His plans, Jesus takes and He speaks them into existence. Now, Jesus made it clear that He always does the will of His Father. He doesn't do anything on his own accord. In fact, he sees his father creating, and he creates also. That's in John. We'll, we'll go over that too. So God is the originator or the planner, or he comes up with these grand and beautiful ideas or revelations or anything, and Jesus speaks them into existence. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit that makes it happen. He makes it happen. So you can say, you know, God gives the check. If you want to do an analogy like a check, but Jesus has to sign it that you can cash it. If you if if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus has to sign. So so all three everything has to come into agreement for things to be created. So through Jesus everything was made. Uh, so all things were made through Him, through Christ, and without Christ or Him, nothing was made that was made. Very clear. Everything was created by Jesus. And again, the Father was the originator. In Him was life. So in Christ, 
or in Jesus was life and the life was the light of man so that life that actually illuminates people we are alive everything's alive because of Jesus in fact he holds everything with the power of his word the heavens the worlds the time everything is together so the world is not it can never be shaken why because it's maintained or it's held together by the words of Jesus by the Word of God so Jesus holds everything together he is love so we're alive because he's life so we are alive through him and he's the light of man he is the true life all right and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it light always exposes darkness and darkness flees from the light all the time if you have let's say a light bulb right and you <clears throat> turn it on in a dark room the darkness cannot squash the light bulb what happens it becomes light darkness always flees the light the light always overtakes darkness not the other way around as soon as you have the source of light darkness runs away and we understand the Sun comes up boom night is gone the night cannot overpower the Sun it's impossible the Sun comes up as the light hits then the, then the darkness flees so when Jesus shows up devils run away that's pretty much it they cannot, they cannot be there. They cannot stand. As soon as you shine a light in any area of your life, darkness will flee. There's not a chance that darkness will overtake the light. So, so the, the, the power of sin is, is darkness, is secret. It's to be held in secrecy and to be void of light, exposure. As soon as it's exposed, it goes away. It has to. Because as soon as you bring light into the situation, it runs away that's the principle spiritual principle all right so verse 6 there was a man sent from God whose name was John now it's talking about John the Baptist um, we know that John the Baptist was related to Jesus he was the son um, who can remember the name of Zacharias and who Elizabeth I'll give you <laughs> yeah, yep. they were related to Mary. If you remember, uh, when Mary conceived uh, Jesus by the Spirit, she came to visit Elizabeth, remember? And then uh, Elizabeth was already six months pregnant with John. And when Mary entered, you know, the Holy Spirit, I mean, the baby just reacted. Now, the baby was filled with the whole, John was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. So as soon as the Son of God even though he was, you know, still a fetus, I don't know at what stage of growth, as soon as he came, I mean, the Holy Spirit, there's connection, there was a connection, and John just left with joy. I mean, there was a beautiful connection, just the Holy Spirit joy was poured out, and Elizabeth started prophesying. And anyway, so I'm going ahead. Uh, all right, verse, uh, so John, so it was John the Baptist. So, this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him uh, might believe. So, uh, John was sent before Jesus for a good reason. Uh, for people to accept Christ, it was, it was just a, a radical, radical idea that God had a son. Completely radical. You have to understand the Jewish heritage. They knew that God is a spirit. They were, they had no revelation except Moses he's the only one and prophets too but mainly Moses he's the only one that start talking about <coughs> Jesus that God is gonna send a prophet like me that is among you you have to listen to him because he was prophesying that Jesus is gonna come the greater Moses is gonna come and you have to listen besides that they didn't have that idea that God the Father which is the spirit had a son so it was a very new idea if you grew up in that and then somebody comes in and says you know my father is not Joseph really guys my father is God and they're like <gasps> blasphemy you know how can you say that it was that radical so God sends John now to to believe in that two things have to happen people have to go through a, uh, a moment of softening of heart and repentance.
So John was preaching repentance. Well, here's the key. When everybody went to John to be baptized in the river, in a baptism of repentance. So, who went first? Well, obviously, it was the tax collectors. There were, I mean, different people from different spheres of society. They were being baptized. They were confessing their sins. And John, after they confessed their sins, they would repent. And John would put them completely, submerge them in water. They would come up. And that's how, that's, that's how they would repent before the Lord. That was one of the signs. Um, so when, when Pharisees came, well, they didn't think they needed repentance. And John called them out on that. Now, everybody that were baptized in John's baptism received Christ. It was an easy step. I mean, they repented, their hearts were softened. So when Jesus was preaching the message and he was doing miracles, their hearts were responsive to the salvation message. Well, who did not receive Christ? Those that did not get baptism from John. Who were those people? Well, Pharisees and Sadducees, right? right? Yeah, in fact, in Luke it says that they rejected the will of God by not being baptized with John's baptism. Because they didn't think they needed repentance. I mean, they could understand, you know, like sinners and all the other people, but, but like, why them? I mean, repent for what? You know, they do all these things. And they couldn't, their hearts were so hardened because of that, they could not receive the Son of God. So God sent a man... John prepared to prepare the way for Jesus to come and reveal himself as the Son of God. And that's why John was sent, to prepare the way of the Lord. All right, let's keep going. That all that through him, through John, might believe. Believe in who? In Jesus. Verse 8. He was not that light. So John obviously was not the Messiah, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So he was sent to talk about the Messiah, or introduce the, the Jewish people to the Messiah. Verse 9, that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. That is astounding, astounding verse. I love that verse. Why? Because it talks uh, that Jesus is the true light, that everyone that comes to earth, we were all in Christ before we were born. All of us. We were all in Christ, in Jesus Christ. So as we were sent down to earth, now again, we don't choose at what time, what family. Uh, we don't choose that. God does. So everyone that came down, Jesus knows you personally, and He knows you intimately. And not only that, the light that shines, it has your destiny already set for you. All the days that, um, you know, he has ordained for you to accomplish all the assignments and the David writes you know you have you know all the days are before I was even born you had all the days written for me all the assignments were already there before I even you know was in my mother's womb and born and um, so that light of Jesus knows everybody personally he's a personal God that's the true light that shines on every man as he comes down to earth to you know, dwell the physical body. So he's very personal. He's not like, oh, I'm over here and Jesus is over there. No, no, no. He saw your spirit. He knows everything about you. He has great plans for you. He has assignments for you. He has callings, giftings. All of that Jesus has for you. He knows about it. He's very involved with you. And then we're sent to the earth. And we have to search out those things by the Spirit, what Jesus has put in us as we, as we came to earth. So that's why we have the Holy Spirit, the Helper, to find out what is the will of God for my life. Well, how do we find out? Well, the Holy Spirit. By the Spirit, we know what God gave uh, us, our assignments, our calling. You know, once we come to Him, we get connected to, back to God, we get born again. Then the Holy Spirit starts leading us into His will, starts guiding us into the assignments that He has prepared for us before we were even born. All right, so, he, so Jesus is the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world, uh, or enlightenment. Uh, he was in the world, and the world was made through Him, and the world <coughs> did not know Him. 
So he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Interesting passage. So he created this planet. He came to this planet, and the plan, or the people, or the, you know, created, uh, the creation, or the people of that time did not know that God was, was walking among them. In fact, it's kind of interesting that Jesus was walking on earth that he made. He ate the food that he technically created. He worked with wood, you know, he was a carpenter, that he created. Can you imagine uh, how amazing his, his things were? As he, you know, maybe, I don't know what they were making, he was a carpenter, but people that would go buy, you know, this, whatever, tables or chairs or whatever they were making. And, you know, it's like, Jesus, he not only made it, he created the wood that this, this is made of. Mm. And people didn't know he was the most underestimated man mm. that walked the earth. Mm -hmm. Under every, anywhere he went, he was so underestimated. They had no idea that God was walking among man. That's... Mm. It's just mind-blowing that God was actually walking around on this earth for 33 years. Hmm. The same or so he was the Lord of hosts walking. The Isaiah 6 chapter, now we're so, we love the Isaiah 6, how he's up in, 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 the heavenly, uh, in, in the heavenly temple and he sees Jesus and he's just in awe. You know, the, you know, the glory, the train of the robe, the, the glory of God that filled the temple. Woe to me, so he's crying out, I am undone. This glory, he couldn't even, the seraphim had to close their eyes. I mean, the power, the raw power that just emanated from Christ. And here he is, he's walking among his creation, and people had no idea that it was God among men, or Emmanuel, right? God with us, literally, in the flesh. All right? Keep going. I can go on for a long time about that. <laughs> As you guys know me, I have to keep focused. It's a okay. scary thought to think, though, too, at the yeah. same time. Like, you know, there's God was here, and there's people who didn't know that he was here. Yeah. And, in fact, the cities that saw the most miracles, Capernaum and all the cities that he preached, were going to be judged because of all the miracles that did not recognize who he was. So there is a glory dimension, but there's a judgment dimension because you get all this revelation, glory, and healings, supernatural things going on. And if you reject that, well, that's, you know, trouble comes. There is judgment that, that God. And he did. He judged all of the cities that Jesus showed the most power. And they did not re recognize him. So true. So, um, all right, verse, so he came to his own which means to the Jewish people and his own did not receive him so the Jewish people or the I mean we're talking about when it talks about his own it means his leader uh, the, the leadership did not receive him I mean there's a lot of people Jewish people that obviously receive him I mean they follow him and we know the apostles we know you know uh, Mary of Bethany I mean there was uh, a lot of people that followed him and accepted him but when it says that his own the next receive him means that the leadership of Jerusalem, the leaders, the church leaders, the pastors, the shepherds, they did not receive him. They actually rejected him. But, so there's those people, as many as received him, so those that did believe in him, verse 12, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name very interesting and the reason for that is Jewish people they claim that they are children of God their heritage because God called them their children their children of Israel right mm -hmm. so they so they, they they claim that heritage but here's the deal that even though they came from the Jewish um, heritage or the Jewish line through uh, through blood, the bloodline, the Jewish bloodline, it does did not necessarily mean that they were children. Now they were children of God through Abrahamic, through that bloodline, yes, true, but they were not spiritual children of God. 
They were not. It doesn't, just because they were Jewish, mm -hmm. they still needed Jesus. Mm -hmm. right. And he came to his own. Why? To save his own people. So they would believe unto him. And that way they would become not only the children through the, the, by the, the flesh, you know, the, the bloodline, just the physical uh, relation through, uh, through Abraham or down to Abraham, but the actual the children of the promise. Now the promise was in Isaac, right? Mm -hmm. Isaac, that was the promised seed. I mean, Abraham had other kids too. But the promise seed is the spiritual promise of Christ. That's who the children of God are. Those who receive Jesus are the children of God. Now, he gave the right, means he gave authority to become children of God. Now, as children of God, we have authority. That's very important. Well, what does that mean to have authority as a children of God? Well, as we're his ch children, part of his family, we have authority and dominion. But here's the deal. We have to enforce it. We have to enforce dominion. Um, the whole ministry of special deliverance ministry is based on that fact alone. If you're not born again, <coughs> we might as, I mean, it's useless to pray unless God intervenes. I mean, some people, in some situations, God does intervene because they can't even repent. They just, they just lose their mind and, and you can't get them they're not conscious, basically, that's what I'm saying. So, but um, those who receive Jesus and are born again, they have authority to take back dominion. So it's the soul, their mind, their body, their circumstances, finances, all the blessings that God has in Deuteronomy chapter 28 belong to His children. A lot of times people don't live in that because they don't take it. They just don't take those. And a great example of that will be if you know how Israelites uh, took the promised land, but did you know that they did not take all of it? Mm -hmm. They just decided not to do it. They thought that, well, it was a little hard. There were mountains, they had chariots. So what they did is said, hey, we'll make a deal. You pay us tribute, we'll leave you alone. Well, what did God say when they did that? Well, what God said is, because you did not expel and took possession of what I promised you can have, I will leave them. There will be a thorn on your side. There will be a net for your feet. Because you did not take the inheritance, you did not cast them out. You did not, those areas, those high places, you were afraid of chariots, you were afraid of giants. Uh, you didn't want to fight anymore. You were done fighting. You know, the, with Joshua, it was 40, 60 years of warfare. <clears throat> we're tired. We don't want to do it. And God said, because you didn't take possession. And he said, that's why I'm not going to take them out. They're going to be there because you let them be there. Now, they could have exercised dominion because God gave them the promise. Mm -hmm. Well, when God gives you a promise, you can never lose. Every time you go get it, you will win. Every single time. The only time you lose out if you don't. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the cities, and if you read the book of Joshua and Judges, what was their biggest problem? Fear. Enemies around them. A city here, a city there. And what did they do? Well, those cities got stronger. Joshua died, you know. Israelites kind of settled. But they had all these cities that they did not take where God commanded them to take them. So what they did, they would come out with chariots that had better technology, and they were terrorizing the children of God. And they were constantly oppressed. Now, if they would have taken the promise, there would be no enemies. They would fully possess whatever God promised them. So anyways, so to, be, to have the right to be children of God means to have a Authority to take back everything that belongs to us in Christ Jesus. Take authority. It's a right. It, God says, you have dominion. Now go and get those giants. Like, this is your promised land. You have to expel them. You have to root them out. You have to fight. Here's the good news. 
If you do that, you will never lose a battle. You will always win. Jesus always prevails. All the time. He's, if you use his name, if you go with warfare, you will win. The devil doesn't win. Mm -hmm. The only time he wins, if we allow him to stay. Right. Yep. If we say, like, I'm tired, you know, these giants are too big. You know what, if I leave them alone, they'll leave me alone, they make deals. Well, it might work for a little bit, right. but they get stronger, and then they start attacking yep. you. Yep. So as children of God, we have authority. Praise God. All right. So, uh, okay. So now, those people or the children of God who were born, it talks about a spiritual born. Again, to be children of God, you have to be spiritually born, not born you know, in a, in a Jewish uh, family. Not of blood, meaning bloodlines, which is, would be children of Abraham. They would claim that, that they're children of God. They still do. So, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, to become children of God, so, my children, right? They're born, but they, they, they don't automatically became, become children of God. And we know that, right? Mm -hmm. What do they have to do? Receive Except Jesus. Yeah. yeah, accept them. And Pretty receive. much. So there are some people actually out there, they're thinking if they come from a Christian family, they're automatically children of God. They're not automatically children of God. Now, there's some period of time where they're under the protection and the covering of their parents. They're sanctified by their parents. It's in the Bible. It's in Corinthians. But the times there comes a time of accountability, and you know that age. What the Bible kind of mentions is when they can discern right hand from the left hand. So when they can make conscious decisions, at that time they have to receive Jesus as their personal savior. So, so, so for some time, I mean, it could be longer for some, depending on their mental development too. I mean, uh, if children don't develop mentally where they can make that conscious decision, I believe. They are children. They're under that protection of God. Mm -hmm. Same thing if little kids die, or or, or um, uh, you know, there's there's something happening, or an accident, or the baby dies in the womb, or whatever the case may be. Those, I believe, that, that they belong to God, hundred percent, hundred percent. And there's some scriptures for that. I'm, I'm not going to go into that. So, um, so, like what so, if, so like when I was, and I'm, you know, I know that I belong to Jesus now. But like when I was little, I believed that I was. Like, you know, my mom never brought me to church or anything, mm -hmm. but, like, I was baptized as a baby. Mm -hmm. And, like, when, like, I know for me growing up, I was like, well, that must mean I'm able to go to heaven because I was baptized as a baby. And I didn't have to make that conscious decision by myself. Now, um, here's why, do you guys wonder why uh, Catholics and some other, uh, you know, Christian faith baptized babies. Did you guys know why they do that? To dedicate, right? To dedicate. No, I can explain. So here's the explanation. So Mark 16, there's one scripture in the Bible that when Jesus gives the Great Commission, it's in Mark, where where it states that uh, preach you know, the gospel to all creation, to all creatures, and those who believe and get baptized will be saved. So it's the wording. Um. Because okay, believe, see. baptize, save. So, yep. they, so, so their theology is built on that. They said, okay, for the salvation to be complete, they have to believe, and then they have to water baptize them super quickly before they die. Or the salvation is not complete. Now, that theology is, is wrong. I believe you're saved first, and then you're baptized. It doesn't have to be right away. It could be, you know, three days later. You're just basically declaring what happened in the spirit. It's a public declaration of whatever happened inwardly already. Like the thief on the cross. Well, he didn't get baptized, but Jesus says you'll be, in, you know, he repented. Right. Jesus says you'll be in paradise with me. Right away. I mean, there was no time, oh, you know, let's go baptize him now because he needs to be <laughs> finished. But they take that scripture in Mark, which is, you do have to get baptized. That's part of the gospel, you know. We, we preach the gospel, people repent, and then they have to go through water baptism. Very important. So, so they teach, like, well, what if the baby doesn't mature enough where you can give baptism like the you know, baptized adults or age of accountability? So they decided, it's the Catholic Church, and um, decided, well, what, if we baby's born, we'll quickly sprinkle, we'll baptize him right away. That way, for sure, 
because back then babies died all the time. I mean, the mortality rate was so great, and the parents were really nervous about their kids not being safe. So as soon as it was born, they tried to baptize them, so to seal that salvation, so if the baby dies from fever or whatever, then he will be for sure saved. Again, um, that's what they teach, and that's why they baptize um, infants, for that reason. Because they don't think that the salvation is complete without water baptism. I believe um, in some scriptures there's places in the Bible that first people are saved, born again, and then, it doesn't have to be right away, it could be next day, they're baptized. Um, it's not, you know, you believe that you have to find a pond or a river to quickly baptize him before he dies. You know, that's not. You're saved first, and then you're baptized. So anyway, so that's why a lot of faith baptized babies, because of that Mark 16 scripture. Um, again, baptism very important. Uh, if you're saved, you have to get baptized, but it doesn't mean that same second you're saved. Yeah. Although it's fine if you, if you do get baptized, same second you're saved. Then we can do uh, in the pool, you know, just line people up in the pool and just mm -hmm. preach the gospel and go, okay, <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. next batch, you know. <laughs> or just, just, <laughs> just synchronize, <laughs> synchronize back to baptism. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, so basically water baptism is declaration in the physical, natural realm, what happened in the spiritual. You are yeah. declaring, you know, um, did you know that God marries people, right? But you have to have witnesses. There's no such thing as secret weddings. Even though God is the one that joins people, God joins people. But he says you have to make sure there's some witnesses. You have to declare it publicly. There have to be witnesses, mother, father, a couple friends at least. Uh, you can't just, you know, some people think they can get married, just two of them, you know, pray and then they're married. No, you have to have witnesses. I mean, it, if, if, yeah. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, so they would go in a barn, quickly get married, hold hands, and just, you know, well, God marry us, and then, you know. No. No, no, no. There have to be witnesses there. So, so the same with baptism. I mean, we get saved because God marries people and God saves people. And He does it. We don't do that. We just, you know, he, He's the one that saves. But there has to be a public declaration of our faith. You have to declare before men, I belong to God now, my old life is done away, it's dead, it died, it's buried, and I'm a new creation, not in your spirit, again, it's, it's your spiritual declaration, what happens not in your soul, but in your spirit, because there's a lot of, that's why we have teachers, apostles, prophets, why? To get the saints that are spiritually perfect, but in their soul are still weak, that they have to, that they have to grow in God, there's, there's this you know, teaching, you know, preaching. That's why we have people that counsel people and all this stuff. That's, 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 that's the, why the church is for. Is, is so the saints, the perfection of the saints is in the Ephesians. That's where, you know, there's apostles. That's why there's ministry. There's fivefold. That's why there's spiritual gifts. Why do we need spiritual gifts? Well, for the perfection, to help us. Because we're still being perfected until we leave this body or be, get transformed at the resurrection of the dead or the rapture. Okay, so we go down. Um, all right, so obviously children of God are not those who are born through the bloodline, are considered children of God, uh, are those who are spiritually born through faith in Christ, are considered by God children of God. So if you're a Jewish person and you love God, Jehovah God, and you worship Him, and, but if you don't accept Jesus, you are not the child of God in your spirit. So when you die, you don't inherit the kingdom of God. Now, before Christ, they, they were saved through the promise of the Messiah. By faith, still by faith. The righteous is always saved by faith. Now, back then, they believed that the Messiah is coming, and they were saved. Now we believe what he did on the cross. So we kind of look back. They always looked forward. Remember in Hebrews 11, what faith is. is they, they walked you know, on this earth, and they had the city. They looked forward to the city that the maker, the holy city, New Jerusalem, that's what's in their mind. That's why they were able to leave and wander around, you know, because in their minds, they believe that God is going to save them. You know, and they were not perfect. Not David, Abraham. There's some stories, Moses. It just, I mean, there's stories and there are faults in their lives. 
That's why Paul makes in Romans this point that the, the justification is by faith alone. Mm -hmm. Not in works. Even though we try to do good works. But blessed is the man whom God forgives sins. I mean, this is it. It's like you come, Jesus or God, back then, like, they would ask God to forgive their sins, and he would. Because he, they would come and, and hope in his mercy, and they would get it. Anybody who thought they were uh, trying to do it through their works could not attain salvation. They died in their self-righteousness and never attained forgiveness of their sins. It's unfortunate, but that's how it was. So, so now we are beneficiaries of what Jesus did, so we look back on Calvary, we believe on, you know, unto Christ, and we are saved, and we are children of God, and we have the authority or the right to uh, take dominion. Okay, verse 14. Finally, we got to our verse. Mm -hmm. Through the little recap. So now we're going to go verse by verse. All right, verse 14. That was a long recap. Very long recap. All right. <laughs> and the Word, or Jesus, became flesh. Okay, what does that mean? So Jesus existed, right? Talked about that he was always, there was no time that he never existed. So he was, you know, in God. And then uh, God revealed Jesus. He was actually given birth to Christ. So he became visible. So Jesus became an image of the invisible God. Before that, Jesus was the spirit. I mean, you couldn't see him. He was in God. Uh, but then he, from the bosom or from the inside of God, Jesus came out and the creation could see him. He actually was visible. And he was a representation of the glory of his Father. So nobody can see God. Well, again, it's in this chapter that no man has seen God. Um, you know, Philip wanted to see the Father and said, you know, show us the Father and, and it'll be good for us. And then Jesus says, Philip, look at me. <laughs> Just look at me. Don't you believe that the Father is in me and I'm in the Father? I mean, you look at me, you look at, you're looking at the Father. Um, because you know you can't see Father, you can't see God. He's a spirit. He's, uh, Paul writes in um, Tim uh, First Timothy that he dwells in an unapproachable light. Um, no man has seen him; they can't see him. So Christ is basically uh, between creation and the Father. It's Jesus between creation and the Father. So everything goes through Jesus. Absolutely everything goes through Him. In the created order, either heavenly or earthly realms, everything goes through Christ, through the Son of God. He, In fact, He inherited everything. So God gave Jesus this beautiful inheritance in the heavenlies and in the earthly realms. Okay, so, the Word became flesh, so Jesus became man. So, his spirit came down, just like we come down, and we and he indwell the, the the body, a physical body. So God became man. That's again, it's it's a mystery, and Paul writes, it's it's a mystery that God became man. It, it's you can't even comprehend what that means. Well, what does it entail? That God that is omnipresent all-powerful, is everywhere at the same time, all-knowing, is now confined in a physical body. It's a mystery. I mean, it's hard to comprehend it. I mean, in Jesus, you have the fullness of God in a bodily form. That's Colossians. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity in a human body. That's why it's a mystery. That's why it's hard to comprehend. That's why Jesus is so beautiful and wonderful. He's fully God, but he's fully man, so we can touch him and get close to him, okay? Because remember, God dwells in an approachable light. The power of Jesus, Isaiah 6, Isaiah couldn't even stand. Seraphim had to close their eyes. That glory, that power, it just can't handle it. God loves people so much. Jesus, I'm going to become man so I can be closer. So the question is like, who are you that you were so high? You came down so low that you could draw us near to you. That's love. That's insane. That's love. I mean, there's no other way. He didn't have to do it, no. do it, but he loved his people so much, his bride, that he took on the body, the physical body. And he has the physical body forever. 
we can't just put it aside. It's not like he got resurrected, like, whew, I'm done with this, you know, puts aside his physical body now. No, no, he's always gonna be man, all the time. Fully God, fully man, forever. That's who he is. That's why um, it's, it's amazing for us, because now we can completely relate to him, because, you know, he's one of us. He's, he has a, has a body, he has a physical body. Um, and that's, that's a glorious, that's another subject we'll go into later, all right. All right, so, um, among, so he and dwelt among us, so he walked on earth, we talked about it a little bit, that God was walking in the human body, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, Jesus. He's so gracious, he's so kind. Just think about it. How many times we come to him? I mean, we screw up all the time. I mean, I agree. Admit it. Yes. We do. We do. But he's full of grace. He's full of... Why, Jesus, do you take us back all the time? I mean, did you guys wonder that? Yeah. I did. <laughs> like, God, like, I am so dull. Like, why do you pursue me and you want to spend time with me? I can't yeah. tell you anything you don't know. You know everything. <laughs> but yet you want to be with me. Why? just don't understand it like why do you love me so much but that's who he is you can't change that that's who he is his love that's why he took on the body the human body so he can draw us you know, so we can give him an embrace you know and of course I mean his glory he could dial it up and like John when he saw his <laughs> his right in the chapter 1 and, and revelation yes he felt like a dead man but then he could dial it down the disciples to the Road of em Emos, Emos, Emmaus. Emmaus. Yep. They could not recognize him. He was just a. They thought he was just a bystander. You know, he was so simple, like mm -hmm. Jesus, his holy God. But then John, like he dialed it up again. You know, like whoa, glory, Mount of Transfiguration. They walk with Jesus, like hey, da, da, da. they're talking, they're having good time, and then boom, his face like breaks out like sun. Right. His wow. clothes like breaks in light. Peter, John, and James just fall down. They're they're afraid. Like, what's going on, you know? And then the, the voice from heaven, this is my begotten you know, son whom, I, whom, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him, you know? <laughs> Listen to him, Peter. Listen to what he has to say. It's important. Oh, God. <laughs> we don't want to leave this place. Let's make three tents, you know? So, because of the... And then he dials it down. He's like, hey, guys, okay, time to go home. Time, time to go down the mountain. And they're, like, shocked. Well, yeah, he's fully God. So if he can dial it up. And dial it down. Interesting. All right, keep going. All right, full of grace and truth. So he's gracious and truth. He, Jesus, will always tell you the truth. He will never lie about you. I mean, uh, we lie to ourselves. The biggest problem is that we lie to ourselves most of the time. But he's full of truth and grace. Again, important. The grace dynamic is so important. When he tells us the truth about us, it's because he's full of grace. He wants to free us. From, from our lives, from our bond. Because he loves us so much. I mean, there's no alternative motive but love. So he's full of grace, but he's full of truth. He will tell you exactly what he thinks. He will. <laughs> I mean, he's not going to say, oh, you know, you struggle with this. Oh, okay, I, I understand. You kind of came from that. No, no, no. He'll tell you. No. Amen. I gave you authority. Amen. You are the children of, you're the child of God. There's no way you're going to live like this. You have power. You have the anointing. You have your. I give you my Holy Spirit. There's no excuse. So, so he's not gonna glaze over our problems. He, in fact, truth. He'll reveal it. Why? Because he wants to help break us free from the bonds. Mm -hmm. He wants to remove everything that hinders love in our lives. That's his primary object. To get rid of, you know, the earth. Why is he gonna strike the earth? People will get offended at the fact that Jesus is gonna crush the earth or, or strike the earth. That's a more proper way to say. It. And kill a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, why? Because he wants to remove sin and remove everything that hinders love. Amen. He does everything for love. Everything for love. So he sees his church being oppressed. Well, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to step in? For sure. He's going to burn with zeal. In fact, Isaiah 63, if you read it, it's a beautiful passage. Why? Because it's the deliverance of the ones he loves. He's coming to deliver his church, the one he loves. His children, his 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 people, Jewish people too. He's gonna come and save them. 
at the, at the end. So he's full of truth, he's full of grace. He will always tell us exactly what he thinks. He's not gonna glaze over anything. He's gonna shine his light, again, his light, remember light, he shines the light, expose it. He wants us to repent and then he gives grace. The embrace, the forgiveness. And then you feel like, oh God, like, why do you love me so much? You know, why, do, it's like always that, like why, why, why? Because he love, he, he can't be any other. He's love, he's love. And when God loves, he loves fully with all of his heart, all of his mind, all of his strength. That is the only way he can love because he's love. I mean, God is love. He can't love this one person a little bit more. Now he has favor and yeah, if you, he will reward you for, for obedience. He has favor with some people, absolutely. But his love, he can't have a little bit more here, a little bit more there. He's full. He's complete. It's, he's all in it. So that's why um, the biggest judgment, or why judgment comes, is, is people reject his love. Not, you know, we think, oh, because of sin. Partly because of sin. But Paul writes that God will judge people because they rejected his love. That's it. Not so much what they did. It's the rejection of Jesus' love. And God said, I will, I will punish you for that. There is no reason for that. I mean, he gave himself up for you. He has been pursuing you all of your life. If you reject that, he will be condemned for eternity because of that. Now, we think like, oh, something I did. Yeah, it will lead you there, disobedience. But the biggest thing is rejecting his love. So anyways, we're keeping, we keep going to verse 15. So it says that, uh, okay, I will finish 14. So his glory, the glory of, uh, okay, we got that. 15, John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, remember that John had a big following. I mean, thousands of people. I mean, it was his time. His popularity was ascending. Uh, John was the prophet. And some thought he was Elijah. Some thought he was the Christ. Um, they were just trying to figure him out. It's such anointing on him. It's just the repentance, just the level of power that he, that he spoke. It's just a prophetic voice in the wilderness. It was just so, so powerful. But, but he says, look, I'm not the one. I'm just sent to introduce the one that was before I was even conceived, born. He's fully God. I'm just pointing to him. And later he will say by the Holy Spirit, Behold the Lamb of God. I mean, that, what a statement. What a statement from John. So he's popular. You know, people are following him. He has all this, like, you guys, you don't understand. I'm here to point to the one who was before me, who was always there, always existed from eternity, is the Christ. And that's what he did. And there was a time in John's life where people started shifting from him to Jesus. And he was losing disciples. And disciples, you know, we'll read on a little bit later in, in the second chapter. And that they were a little nervous. Like, John, you know, people are leaving you. They're going to this Nazarene and he's baptizing now. Like, what's going on? And John says, you guys don't understand. He's the bridegroom. Guys, I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. I'm just leading people to him. My time has come that I must decrease. I'm done, guys. He knew he was gonna be, he was gonna die soon. I believe it. He knew it. He knew he was gonna be, um, you know, put in put in prison by Herod. And he says, "You guys don't understand. My time is done here." And he pointed to Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. I mean. A true prophet that wasn't afraid that people were leaving him and you know following Jesus because miracles were breaking out and he says you guys my time is done here can you imagine a, a, a leader a pastor says you know God's using somebody and people are leaving him and says this is amazing praise God my time here is <laughs> no here. I can't imagine it. can you imagine that no, no. <laughs> that's why John is so special <laughs> he's true man of God where the decrease he saw, 
the people weren't following him anymore, but they were following somebody that had an anointing of the Spirit on them. He said, that's good. Go. He's the one that God's using now. My time is drawing close. And so that paradigm of God is my rewarder, not people. God, as soon as I'm finished with my assignment, my head's going to come off. I'm going to go see the Father. I'm going back to the Father. And that's what happened. And guess who killed John? Can I kill John? Right? True. But the woman, actually, the woman. Herodias. Herodias, yeah. yes. Now, that's, again, I'm going to do a little, a little snippet. She operated in the spirit of Jezebel. Now, spirit of Jezebel, if you go back all the way to Elijah, the prophet, and Ahab, and all that stuff, she pursued the prophet of God. She killed off the prophets. Now, she established Baal worship. Now, Baal worship is not just a, a statue so of people Jezebel worship. So, Jezebel started that? Well, she didn't start it, but she was really enforcing it in Israel. Because mm -hmm. she came from Phoenicia. She was a Phoenician princess. So, they worshiped Baal. And worship of Baal uh, was done, in the, the, the two main themes when people were worshiping Baal was um, immorality and um, witchcraft. It was, it was the two wrapped around. Mm -hmm. So everything they did was in those two things. So the point of her really trying to instill it in Israel is to disattach Israel from the promise, from, from God. She knew what she was doing. She was, she was so demonized that um, she knew exactly what she was. She knew if immorality will, will break forth in Israel to the measure and witchcraft that God is going to punish the nation. I mean, there was a deliberate attack on the prophets and on the and the nation as well. So that spirit, you know, she died and, and obviously, you know, she was thrown out of the window and she died. But the spirit of Jezebel reappears in scriptures. I mean, so now that girl, she dances before Herod. And all of you think, like, why would a dance? Now, Herod liked John. It yeah. says in Mark that he actually liked and listened and feared him. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's the wife that was mad because, you know, anyways, it was Philip, the brother. But it's, so she was mad that, that, that John the Baptist says, you can't have her. She, you know, she's the wife of, of, of Philip. I mean, of the brother. I mean, come on, what are you doing? So, so he, that's why he imprisoned him. But, so when, when she, that, that the girl danced, that spirit, it just came over him and he says, I'm going to give you half the kingdom. Ask right now. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to give it to you up to, my, up to the hand you know, of my kingdom. Well, she doesn't need money. Now, spirit of Jezebel doesn't need money. What it wants is to take out the prophets of God. That's it. So she says right away, give me the head of John the Baptist on the plate. So the spirit of Jezebel is always attacking the prophets of God, the ministers of the Lord. Always. That's the primary target. Is pastors, is men in the households, and the spirit of Jezebel, in fact, mostly operated by men. Now, the women are used too, but uh, who does uh, the pornography? It's, it's, it's the arm of the Jezebel spirit. It's the whole industry. Well, who runs it? Yeah, there's some women involved, but mostly it's run by man. You know, it's a spirit. And he uses women, unfortunately. And people know well too well what happens. They're being used, but why? Did you know how many pastors are hooked on pornography? Tons. Yeah. Tons. It's a demonic spirit. It's taking out ministers. That's the, that's the objective. Give me the head of John the Baptist. I don't want your money. I want the prophets. I'm going to kill them off. That's what Jezebel did. Now, what did Elijah do? Now, if you know that... Didn't Elijah flee? Well, he flew after he slew the, the, the Baal. He ran away from her because she was such, so powerful spiritually. Yeah, he had to run. But uh, do you know that John the Baptist operated in the spirit of Elijah? It's in Luke chapter 2, chapter 1. John the Baptist operated in the spirit of Elijah. We have the Jezebel and Elijah dynamic going on here. Yeah. You know, what well, spirit of Elijah, what does he come here to do? Like well, Malachi 4, 5. God says at the end, you know, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, I'm going to send to you the prophet Elijah 
Why? So he would turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. That reconnection, that reconciliation, that restoration of that family, of the purity of the, of the family unit. Now, what did Elijah do when he was fighting with Jezebel's pro, uh, Baal, uh, priests? He rebuilt the altar. Mm -hmm. So the spirit of Elijah or the anointing of Elijah rebuilds the altar of prayer in the houses. Well, how do the families come together? Well, prayer comes into the family. When fathers and mothers start to pray, there's an anointing to bring the family together. Now, Jezebel breaks family up. Pornography and immorality will destroy every marriage. It, it touches. Prayer will bring it back together. So that's the war between the spirit of Elijah and the spirit of Jezebel. It's raging right now. There's coming a showdown between the church full of the Holy Spirit and power and the devil worshipers in this world. It's going to be this defined line. You know, when Antichrist starts uh, coming on the scene, that's going to be that devil worship, the spirit of Jezebel and Elijah, or the church that walks in the anointing of the Holy Spirit and purity. And they're coming to a collision. And that's the trumpets. So that's seal number five and number six. But that's a different topic. All right, so <laughs> I'm not going to fall further. I'm not going to go into the seals. <laughs> Maybe later. All right, so that's John. Uh, so he operated in the spirit of Elijah. That's Luke chapter one. If you want to cross-reference that. So then he, uh, last verse, and then we'll be done. And maybe have questions. Okay, so. And of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. Of his fullness, of Jesus' fullness. Now, he's fully God. We have all received grace for grace because he's fully God. He abounds with grace. That's where we go. We draw on to him because he is God. He can do it. He can do anything. Whatever is impossible with man is possible with God. That's why Jesus can do anything. And we cannot do anything apart from him. He said you can't do anything. You have to abide in me. That's the only way is abiding in him to receive grace upon grace. To be attached to the vine. You know, uh, John 15, we'll, we'll talk about the vineyard and the vine. We are the branches. We are attached to Jesus, to, the, to Christ. And we are drawing on the power of His Spirit for our life. That's how we produce fruit. Now, the Father, or the vine dresser, He, he trims us. So He cuts out things. Why? So we can bring more fruit. So we'll be more fruitful. So Father, now it hurts when He cuts us. It does hurt because He cuts out areas in our life that hinder the fruit. But the good news is, if we're attached unto Jesus, unto the wine, we become, we, we, start, we start receiving that life-giving spirit that keeps us going and bearing fruit. And that's amazing. Now, if we cut off the source, what happens to the branch if it falls away from Christ? It withers away, and where does it go? Into the fire. That's it. I mean, it has no, no use for anything else. I mean, uh, you know, if anybody see how the vineyard grows, those branches like this, they have absolutely no use with the, apart from fruit. What are you going to use the vine branch from nothing? It's just it's so crooked. It, it's, it's good for nothing but to be uh, fire. Wood. That's it. That's all the purpose. Now, when it produces grapes, it's beautiful. It, the, the value of it is the fruit always, not the wood. Like the cedar, the value is in the wood. It has no fruit. So we need cedar for building material. Well, the vineyard or the vine, the value is in the fruit. It's the root and then the fruit. Not so much branches. You can't use them for anything. You can't build a house out of the, that material. So anyway, so we're going to stop here. If anybody has questions, we can do a discussion. Eugenia, how are we doing on time? Okay, I think yeah, if anybody has questions, we can on what we talked about. Uh, nobody. 
I explained everything really good. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm, glad. <laughs> I'm learning myself. Whole different go. perspective. Thank I you, Holy it. Spirit. Yes, for, yeah. Let's pray. Father, I'm just so thankful, Lord, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You gave us your Holy Spirit that is the teacher. We are the students. Holy Spirit, you teach us. The anointing that teaches us all things and it's true. And we rely on you, Holy Spirit. Jesus said we could lean on you, Holy Spirit. Fully trust your leadership in our lives, and we do. And you will teach us, and you will reveal our future to us, God. And everything that God has for us, His will in our lives, Holy Spirit, reveal it to our human spirit, to our heart, that we may know the assignments you have for us, God, that we may grow in love, that we may bear fruit, that we may grow in love, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.